Hi, everybody. Welcome again to another episode of the Shop Notes podcast. I'm your host, Phil. We're joined today by just John. We've kicked Logan off the show temporarily while he's attending a sawmilling conference in eastern Iowa put on by North Carolina. Not sure how that works, but that's what it is. We're going to dip into the mailbag today a little bit and give a little update on some projects that we have working on on our own. So I hope you enjoy today's show. This episode of the Shop Notes podcast is brought to you by Woodsmith Magazine. Woodsmith Magazine has been the trusted source for all your woodworking information for over 40 years. From tips and techniques to furniture projects to shop projects, you'll find it all at Woodsmith Magazine. Subscribe today at woodsmith.com. So, John, I think the best part of doing the podcast is the idea that we really would like to have a plan, maybe a topic or three to discuss in an episode. But what it turns out to be more of the time is, hey, we should podcast. How about right now? It's like, what are we talking about? I don't know. <laughs> Flip the switch. We're live. Yep. Yeah. So, and that was the case last week mm-hmm. when we uh, we generated some interest on that one based on the comments on our YouTube channel, which I thought was kind of kind of funny because going into it, here's where I was going is I've seen you been working on a few home improvement projects. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, just stuff you've been working away at for a few years or whatever. Like, I mean, I think you did house numbers yeah. and <laughs> a few other things like that. So the question came to me is knowing your personality a little bit and my personality is as a woodworker, do you approach those projects in a way that somebody who isn't a woodworker going to approach them? Right. And I'm not sure how the question got changed into what it means to be a woodworker, (laughs) but it did. That's what happened. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's one of those discussions that gets kind of philosophical at times. So I think it probably struck a lot of, or got a lot of comments just because everybody has a different definition to that or whether it be broad or specific or or whatnot. So I think a lot of people had to chime in and share what they thought. Yeah. And it's always interesting. So yeah, appreciate that. So I thought just in interest of continuing that conversation a little bit, and because we had so many comments, I was going to read through a few Mm -hmm. of those on here and we can, we can talk about them. Uh, One of them, Chuck writes, I'm a little disappointed in Logan. I expected his deck to have hand-turned bird's eye maple posts and rails. Yeah. And then said for next week, maybe discuss sawmill operator or negative gardener. (laughs) Yes, that, that makes sense. But yeah, I think we're all a little disappointed in Logan. I mean, we're not mad at him. (laughs) We're just disappointed. Just a little disappointed. Negative gardener though. Yeah, I could. Yeah. I can see that. Scorcher of earth. Right. Yeah. It's creative destruction. I think it's where we're going with that one. Uh, Christopher Hathaway writes, the woodworkers club in Texas I used to belong to was composed of three main groups of woodworkers, flat borders, turners, and scrollers. All were in various stages of ability, but were considered as woodworkers. Yes. That sounds like um, the tribes of middle earth or something. Flat borders, turners, and scrollers. <laughs> yes. Yeah. It's like last names, mm-hmm. Hobbit yeah. last names. Uh, and I would agree with that because I know that I've been involved with some stuff with the Des Moines woodworkers around here, and they have a pretty pretty large group of people Yeah, that practice all kinds of woodworking. And I think that's where I was trying to go with it is to cast as wide a net as possible on what it means to be a woodworker. Yeah. So Logan's definition was kind of furniture maker or cabinet maker, like, and that would be your flat borders most likely. Yes. Uh, I'm sure some turning could get thrown into furniture making and some scrolling, but yeah. Yeah. But I, 
yeah, I think his point was that it would all be in service of a furniture-y kind of piece. Right. So, which I kind of get, but on the other hand, I don't know that I'm I'm ready to to limit it. Yeah, at that's that. kind of the most general term I would say. Right. Uh, Eric writes only six minutes in, but funny how I would have thought the thought process to their home builds would have been reversed. No offense to any of you. Always interesting dialogue from you all. Thanks. Yeah, we're, we're all walking contradictions mm -hmm. around here that, um, uh, I've said it before is like one of the things that uh, my supervisors were telling me before we hired Logan and I wasn't in on that process is that, you know, like, yo, man, you can't wait till you meet Logan. Like he's, he's a real woodworker cause he does everything with just hand tools. <laughs> and that's, that's exactly not what he is. <sighs> yeah. So. Yeah, it is. It is interesting because he was saying that his DIY um, philosophy is just kind of get it done where mine is right. a little bit more, I don't know, anal retentive. Is that, that's the right word where it's like, that could be over overly detailed on some stuff that is, does it matter? And, and then maybe when it comes to, <laughs> I don't know the actual real woodworking that I might be a little bit like the, flip that a little bit on, on yeah. some stuff. So, but I don't know. It, just, it seems like when I'm, I'm building something that is attached to my house, I find it more permanent. So it's, I'm more detail oriented where if it's like a piece of furniture or whatnot, it's still a pretty detail oriented, but I know that it, it just seems, uh, more temporary because it can be moved or changed or, or whatnot. So sure. Yeah. Well, and I mean, furniture pieces move in and out of your life mm -hmm. pretty regularly. Right. You know, I, one of the first things that I built was a coat tree from plans that appeared in popular mechanics like forever ago. And I had it in my apartment and when we first got married and our first house. And then I think it moved on to like my brother's place or my parents or something like that. And then I don't even know where it is now. So I think it's around, but you know, but you're right. I think stuff that sticks with a house is a little more, a little more permanent. I also think it's interesting and I feel like there are I mean, there's different types of woodworker depending on what you do, but then what you're into woodworking for, right? You know, like is, uh, and I think all of these overlap. So it's like a Venn diagram where the circles kind of cross over each other, you know, that you have woodworkers who are there for the shop time, Yep. whether a project gets done, you know, the denigrating term would be that they're just puttering around or something. Uh, I think you have the woodworkers who are there for the project and it's all about getting the project done. And I think a lot of home improvement folk fall into right. that or it seems to me that way. And then I think you also have the people who are in it for the, the process of woodworking. You know, that they just enjoy tool acquisition or, you know, the actual building of the project. Rather, more you know, so than gets, just having the completed project. It's they're enjoying the journey of making the project. And yes. So. Yeah. They're the two lane highway mm -hmm. folk of the woodworking right. world. Yeah. Yeah, I think a lot of my DIY philosophy comes from when we bought our house, we were planning on, at least I was planning on living there a long time and we've been there for 18 years. So a lot of it was I want to do this well because I want to enjoy it, the end product, and know that it was done well and 
But if you're just – if um, you, I mean if you're someone that moves a lot, you might not as care as much or now that we're getting kind of towards the end of our – um, living in our house, it's like all those projects, like, okay, now I'm to where I just wanted to get it done. It's like, <laughs> as long as it looks good for as long as I'm there and it, if it's not that much longer, great. But, uh, so I still want to get it, you know, done, but not at quite as, you know, anal retentive. So, right. Well, I mean, you have less personally invested in it, right. maybe. I mean, not that you're going to just slap no. it together with cardboard and staples or anything, right. but. Uh, yeah, like that cabinet that I worked on for, what was it, 13 years or whatever. I still made it very well, but you know, I skipped the the dovetail drawers and just went with, with a you know tongue and groove drawer. That's still very good, but it's not the extra right. step, you know, so yeah. stuff like that. Yeah. All right, let's see. Here's a uh, Jeff Kowalski writes, if you work wo work with wood, you're a woodworker. To be a craftsman is a dedication that can take many years to achieve. The first thing you build and realize that you either need a new tool or get creative, you've committed to a goal. Yep. I think that's well well mm -hmm. spoken. Kevin Thomas says, "What do you guys have against Intarsia?" <laughs> I have a friend that makes beautiful pieces of intarsia. There's a lot of work that goes yeah, into it. Phil, why do you hate intarsia? <laughs> why are you trying to start a fight with the intarsia people? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Which would seem to go against my big tent idea of woodworking. Mm -hmm. I think for me, it, I mean, we all have things in woodworking that we choose to do and some that we choose not mm -hmm. to do that you know, cause there's just so much involved with wood turning or woodworking, you know, like wood turning is one of those things that I've done a few things. It's not bad. I enjoyed the process, but probably not going to get a lathe. It's just, it's just a rabbit hole that I don't want to go right. down. Yeah. It's one of those things. like, I appreciate well done on Tarja. You know, it looks great. Um, I respect the work that's put into it, but it's just like, not my thing. Yeah. So. Right. And so that's the thing with intarsia for me is that I've seen a lot of, and this is true of, I mean, I've been to quite a number of craft shows, county fairs, state fairs, and there's always a booth or two of somebody who's put themselves out there to be a woodworker you know, at building custom furniture or cabinetry or something like that. And from my point of view, just needs some help. Mm -hmm. So, and I think sometimes that can put a distaste in my mouth for some things. And that was the same thing with intarsia. I just saw a lot of bad intarsia. And if you only see bad examples of something, then you can easily get a negative view of the whole thing. So... Mm -hmm. I, I totally understand my fault on that. <laughs> it's, uh, but I'm getting yeah. there. I can enjoy well done stuff. And I've, I've seen quite a few, I, I guess you'd call it intarsia on Instagram, like these big giant installation pieces where it's just all these free form shapes that come together to make it look like a giant flower or something or like that. Or a mountain scene so, or... Something right. Like that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that another part of it for me anyway, is that I have a strong inclination towards woodworking that is functional and practical. So, you know, bookcases, tables, doors, desks, that kind of thing. Whereas, you know, intarsia is either added onto a piece or is just on its own. And that's not something that I gravitate yeah. towards. Well, I'm glad you're open-minded in, in, you know, growing and becoming more tolerant <laughs> to the Antarctica people. I appreciate that. Uh, 
let's see, a guy named E.G. Blue Suede. <laughs> That's a real name. Right. I enjoyed the banter today, but I don't think you can define anybody with just one word. I love woodworking, and I'm almost addicted to wood, but I also like leather, metal, plastic, etc. So am I a maker? I also like carving, turning, restoring tools, collecting vintage. So am I a tool junkie? But I also like to cook, make kombucha, tinker with cars. So no single term adequately defines me. To pick on Logan because it's fun, you like turning. I know you carve, you mill lumber and make furniture. So are you just a woodworker? <laughs> He's also a beekeeper well, I don't mind. and hunter right. and trapper and he's many a yeah. thing. Yeah. So. I think we were trying to focus it specifically on the craft and the craft mm -hmm. involving wood. But yeah, I don't think anybody is just one thing. Yeah. I mean, even I do. Uh, I enjoy cooking. I'm the home cook at at my place and... I love do, baking bread and making bread mm -hmm. and fermenting a few things like hot sauce and pickles and that kind yeah. of stuff. So Yeah, no, like I really like some of the projects we've done here at Woodsmith um, that incorporate other materials. I think we've gotten into leather and metal and, and plastics and all those things that he mentioned. And it's kind of fun to, to get outside the woodworking or just wood realm and, and mix some of that stuff into your projects. Um, right. Just because, you know, wood can be boring. So it's nice to add other materials and textures and, and looks. So, and a lot of those things can be worked with woodworking tools or, you know, similar techniques. So it's, it's fun to mix that stuff into. Oh yeah. And I think if you look, I mean, that's not even a new thing either, you know, historic woodworking, often incorporated a lot of that kind of stuff where it's, you know, like even if it's glass panels in a door or stained glass yeah. or, you know, a metal work grill or, you know, whatever. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, Rocky Top Wrangler. He probably just goes by Rocky mm -hmm. for short. Wrote home improvement and home building projects are done by a carpenter. Woodworkers get more immersed in the project more in line with finished project, finish wood projects, works of art, not structural. A carpenter is a craftsman. A woodworker is an artist. Was that a haiku? Uh, no, <laughs> but it could be just a few, yeah. few syllables yeah. off there. I wasn't counting. So <laughs> <laughs> yeah, get where you're saying on that. Bruce Welty stirs the pot here. First, you need to clarify woodworker versus wood machiner. If your shop has three stationary power saws, a planer, jointer, and the latest kick, a CNC machine, you're not a woodworker. Wow. He's calling Chris Fitch out. Yeah, definitely. Hmm. That's Bruce's opinion. Mm hmm. Vern. Vernon. Ekstrom writes, I do not make furniture, but I do make small boxes or a router to make a sign or turn small items on the lathe. See, exactly. Mm -hmm. And he wonders, is making cutting boards, is that a woodworker? Which, uh, that's a hockey stick across the shins because Logan makes plenty of cutting yeah. boards. So we'll have to have to see what he says there. All right. I think mm -hmm. that's it. There were a few others on there, but yeah. some of them not pertaining to the episode strictly. Yeah. So, but yeah, so we appreciate all the comments and yeah, it's always a good discussion. So yeah. And if you'd like to talk more about it, I'd love to hear it. You can email us woodsmith at woodsmith.com or leave comments on our YouTube channel. Uh, one of the comments on the YouTube channel related to, we used to do, on YouTube, a weekly shop tour and update of what's going on. Um, and the system we were using there for that allowed us to simultaneously broadcast to both Facebook and YouTube at the same time. And we haven't, we, there was a software change 
or a hardware change mm -hmm. somewhere in there that took that capability away from us. And I'd, I'd like to get it back for the YouTube folk. But that all that to say is that we still do shop updates. We do them fri or Friday, <laughs> do them Thursdays at 1 p.m. Central Time for the most part. Uh, and that's on Facebook. So if you search for Woodsmith Magazine on the Facebooks, you'll be able to find us for that. That's always kind of a fun to, time to see what's going on in the shop. So, and this week we got a lot going on. Yeah. So everybody who's hearing this podcast is hearing it a day late. <laughs> but watch, if you go back yeah, to go our... watch the live recorded, not live. Yeah. Right. So, <clears throat> which reminds me, the uh, project that you designed, that small rustic bench, the hardware came in for that, which I thought yeah. was kind of cool. Yeah, it was uh, a lot more stout and beefy than I thought it was going to be, just in my mind. I thought it was going to be, because they're selling it as like furniture grade, uh, like turnbuckle right. hardware, and it came and it was like, mm, this could be industrial strength and you know <laughs> be used in a in a building to hold walls up or something but so it's pretty impressive yeah because i was i don't know why but i kind of expected it to be aluminum or something yeah. just to save weight but it's solid yes. that bench is like... not going anywhere <laughs> so. so where did you get that from uh, again i found it by just googling farmhouse turnbuckle furniture. And I came across the website that was uh, farmhousehardware.com, I think was the website. And they sold these kits for um, furniture projects. And so I just ordered it and thought I'd try it. And after I ordered, it, I was like, I wonder where they're from. Cause I just, you know, found it on the web and assumed they were like East coast somewhere or whatever. And saw that their area code was seven one two. So I looked up where that is and it, Apparently it's Western Iowa and they're just up in Northwest <laughs> Iowa a few hours away. So it's like, oh, hey, that's yeah. kind of funny. So small world. So, yeah. So yeah, I got that in and um, Steve actually built the entire bench bef and had finished it and com completed the bench before the hardware came in. And it just, you know, you screw on the little connectors and connect the, the turnbuckle in the, in between the two bars and good to go so we you don't go. need the hardware to get started it was pretty easy so yeah no it's got a nice mm -hmm. look to it and then we did a aged finish on it I yeah think, right um we used we ended up using red oak for the bench and i think varathane is the one that makes this like age like accelerated ager i don't i don't remember what it is but it, you've used it before and it's kind of interesting because it goes on and it looks like you're just putting on brown stain and then within a few minutes it starts turning that patina gray and you can do a couple yeah. coats to darken it up and it it's just like a, a grayed wood look so yeah which you could leave like that and i think we ended up doing a stain on top of that right uh i think I don't know what Steve did, but I think he just did that, the, the gray, the accelerator and, um, sprayed it with lacquer as oh, far okay. as I know, unless he did something in between, yeah. but so, yeah, cool. Yeah. So that might be a project we, cause I ended up, uh, getting two sets of the hardware because it was just, uh, it was, um, discounted by getting. The, the full set rather than buying hmm. pieces. And I was like, oh, that'd be fun to maybe do another one on video. So maybe do a, like a painted version or something. Oh, yeah. So Or even just change up the materials or something. Yeah. Yeah. Just give it a different look. And so it's pretty easy project. You could probably do it in a weekend. and But it's pretty, pretty nice in the end. So it's kind cool. of exciting. Mm -hmm. So what's your next project you're working on? Um, that project was actually for 260 and I am supposed to be drawing wall shelves for an issue before that 259. <laughs> so I might have to jump on that. So that, uh, I think we talked about doing kind of a modular mid-century modern design where it's, uh, wall shelves or cabinets that can kind of hang on 
uprights that would attach to the wall. So, yeah. But so there's just more. It's not complicated, just more parts and and stuff. So I did the bench first to get Steve something to do, and we'll go back and get the the wall shelves drawn up and get started on that next. Yeah, I know that uh, the mid century modern wall systems are super cool to me. Mm-hmm. I don't know what is it, what it is about it. Maybe it's because it's a combination of being a pretty impressive set. You know, it looks impressive, Mm -hmm. but it doesn't take up a lot of space because it's all attached to the wall. Right. Yeah, and I've seen, uh, like, little desktops that, you know, people make it into, like, a home office type thing or a entertainment console type, you know, setup or, you know, different different stuff like that. So it's a lot – you can just go a lot of different directions on it. Yeah. Yeah, because I've seen, you know, like – angled shelving for magazines or Mm -hmm. glass fronted cases and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah. You can just make a pretty simple box that would hang in there and it could be, you put doors on it, you put drawers in it, sliding doors, glass door, you know, change up the look. So just cool. A lot of different directions. So you have any other house projects that you're working on yet? Oh, I don't know if I meant we meant we, we've talked for a long time about me moving. So that looks like that's going to happen in the next month or so. I don't know if we mentioned it here on the podcast, but so a lot of going back now and finishing trim that never got done. Like we redid the kitchen 12 years ago and it got wow. to the point where it was functional and uh, I never put quarter round down around the cabinets <laughs> or there's a few pieces of, you know, trim that never got put up or stuff like that. Um, so, uh, what else been going through my shop garage, which has been fun because if you're just in your shop, it's easy to, Hoard wood and let stuff pile up, <laughs> projects pile up, tools pile up. So now it's kind of the what do I want to keep? What do I want to move? What goes to the dumpster? Kind of a, sure. a refresh, if you will. So, oh, there you it, go. It'd be That's nice a good way to, to look at yeah, it. Yeah. Yeah. To kind of start over. And it's like, what do I actually need? What, what cabinets or work, like, you know, or carts are just things that have gotten stuff piled on them because they're around to actually need those and and kind of decide square footage wise what is going back in the shop so yeah so a lot of the stuff has gone to the dumpster some stuff has come back and might be hidden around (laughs) the company here on shelves because i'm not sure if it's going to the dumpster yet or okay so i might get in trouble from becky for for bringing stuff back that I had once taken and I do have projects around here that I hadn't taken home because didn't have room for them. So hopefully in a month or so I can get those out of here. Sure. But so do you have, was that a consideration in looking for a house was having some kind of a workshop space? Yeah. Just because in general, I mean, you, I mean, Yes. When you have a garage, stuff piles up in it and you're considering like, okay, do I need more space or less stuff? And right. so it was like very much of, okay, I, I do want a space that I can have a shop in, whether it be the garage or some sort of utility room downstairs. So that was, yes, a consideration that we could not stay the same size garage shop or smaller. It had to be more for right. For both my my needs in having a shop and just general storage of outdoor stuff, bikes, snowboards, right. all that yeah. stuff. Because it got to the point where, I mean, we have a two-car garage or two-and-a-half-car garage. And it got to the point or it started with being able to park the our cars in the garage. And then it got to a point where... Okay, we can park the garage, our cars in the garage in the winter 
because <laughs> like, okay, like put all the bikes away. Now we can get two cars in the garage. And then it got to the point where, okay, I can move stuff around and get one car in the garage for the winter. And then it got to the point, no, no cars are going in this garage ever. It's just <laughs> stuff. So it's definitely like, okay, time to reboot all of that and get a little bit more space. So we can get yeah. cars in the garage. Uh, my neighborhood has consists of houses built in the fifties. Mm-hmm. So I don't know if you'd still call that post-war building boom, like the mid fifties. And there are quite a number of houses that have attached one car garages. Yeah. And in my opinion, it's generous to call that even a one car garage. Cause you put a car in it. And I'm not even talking like a gigantic fifties car. Like these are just yeah. normal cars. It's tight. Yeah. You so, pull in, it's like, am I going to be able to get out of this? Yeah. Like, well, the doors open. Right. So, and then I wonder, I mean, cause these it's suburban houses. So there's lawns and gardens and all that kind of stuff. And these were family homes. So, and I'm asking all of our, advanced listeners to write in or let me know, like, did you guys just not have anything or did you keep it out in the yard or what's going on? Because, you know, I don't know. Just feels like. Yeah. We have some houses like that in our neighborhood that have the one car garage, but a lot of them, like my house was built in the sixties and the garage wasn't built until the seventies. So oh, it's like, okay. yeah, I could see parking a car on the garage, but it's like, where do you put your, your lawnmower? Or right. Like, even if you had like one of those like real push mowers or yeah, um, just stuff like that. I mean, tools in general, maybe they had sheds and, and stuff, but yeah. I mean, we've definitely gone to a society that's more stuff. It's like we have all right. these bikes and toys and tools and cars yeah. and like a lot of times people back then only had maybe one car per family and sure and whatnot. And, but. and that part I get, and I know that we've accumulated stuff, you know, we've turned into a storage society, mm-hmm. you know, and a lot of houses in my neighborhood do have garden sheds in the back, but those were much, much later additions mm-hmm. or inclusions on the property. Yeah. You know, but like if that's a family house, like you said, where does the lawnmower go? You know, most families had more than one kid, like those one car garages, you're not putting two or three bikes in there right. plus a car and, you know, garden shears and rakes and shovels. And yeah. And I don't know our, our, you could tell our house was definitely, it, I think it was built on like the edge of town. It might've been like a farm ish house at the time. And now it's in the middle of a suburb. But uh, the way it was built is the back door, the stairs go right down to the basement. And I don't know if that was an unfinished, like, you know, utility work area. Oh, sure. That type of thing where you would go down there and take your boots off and have have tools and stuff down there where now that's a finished basement and yeah. is used as, you know, living space. So yeah. I don't know if that made a difference, but. I definitely would not be taking my lawnmower up and down the stairs. <laughs> it's just, I wouldn't do it. Right. So. so to continue on with that theme, then how are you excited about the possibility of setting up a new shop here or what yeah. kind of changes are you thinking about? Um, yeah, I don't know. It's just a lot of right now kind of paring down and deciding what tools I need and starting from ground zero. Cause I told my wife, it's like when we walk through this, this house that we're getting, it's like you walk through it maybe once or twice for 30 to 45 minutes each. And you look at stuff and then 15 minutes after you leave, it's like, I don't remember any details. <laughs> I think I kind of remember. And I walked through the garage once and it's like, yeah, I don't know anything about this house. So <laughs> And we're buying this house and we don't know anything about it or where anything is or how things work. So it's like on move in day, you kind of just bring everything in and it might be another sort of, you know, kind of shop in, in continuous motion. So 
Sure. I don't remember what's in the garage or for as far as cabinets and that might get gutted and when I bring stuff in and so it's kind of like, yeah, how am I going to set this up? And yeah, it's more space, but is, is stuff just going to spread out and it's going to be <laughs> the same amount of space, it's still gonna not be as much as I thought it was. And yeah. So it's, yeah. But yeah, definitely pare it down to start and then rebuild from basically ground zero. So okay. it'll be fun. That's where, that's where I'm going with anyways, but. Yeah, I think I remember when we moved into our house and I had a basement shop in our first house. Um, and like you said, you just end up collecting stuff because you think you have the space for it. And I had this giant pile of just random pieces of wood that I don't know why I had kept. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like stuff that's not enough to do anything really with. But yeah, so. And it definitely f feels like in the, in the garage we're moving into, there's taller ceilings and I, I'm trying to remember how tall they would be, but like in my garage, it's just rafters at eight feet. Right. So it's like, how can I use that space? The, the vertical space as far as storage or whatnot, I guess I'm not going to like do woodworking 10 feet high, but so <laughs> more of, I guess, putting stuff up and, 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 that, and what you know, we have there, you know, storing tools up higher that aren't being used. So yeah, kind of yeah. using the vertical. When I remember, uh, one of the previous editors, Brian Nelson, when he built his house before retiring had, it was tall walls and ceilings in the garage and he was able to mount I think like he had his air compressor and dust collector kind of up mm -hmm. high, yeah, you know, so that it had, so that not up high, especially for a dust collector, cause he still kind of got to get to it, but you know, high enough that the space below it now turns into usable space. Yeah. Yeah. That's smart. So, all right. I'll keep you uh, updated. <laughs> yeah. That'll be kind of fun to see. It's yeah. New projects. Right. I think that's the best part is that right. you move into a house and you're like, it's moving ready. I really don't need to do anything. And then you're in it for like three weeks and you're like, you know what I need to do? A yeah. bunch of projects. Yeah. Cause we, we definitely got to the point where it's like, we've kind of done everything in this house and mm -hmm. I don't want to do anything else. So new, new, uh, sights and sounds and new mm -hmm. projects. It's a whole so. new coloring book. That's right. So, so I have a, couple of Christmas projects that I'm wrapping up today, which is kind of nice. It'll be cool. fun. To, just in time. Just in time. <laughs> just in time. <laughs> well, like I said, I have said before, I have split family celebrations. So mm -hmm. I have Thanksmas coming yep. up in just under two months now. So it'll be nice yeah. to have a couple of those projects done. And then uh, for our Woodsmith Unlimited subscribers, and then eventually on YouTube, I'm building uh, a pair of sleds that Dylan designed and built that were in the current issue of the magazine. And that sled design is just super cool. And I've actually mm -hmm. been looking at it, one like that for a while and to see Dylan's version and to have the, have him do all the hard work of figuring out the numbers and the sizing of parts and all that kind of stuff was was a delight. So I built two of those for video and I will say that I was surprised on how quickly it all went together. It was a really nice kind of a fun project. Yeah. So, yeah, we haven't done a sled in Woodsmith in a while, probably 20 or 30 years. I don't know, but yeah, probably. Um, it, it should be a pretty fun project and it's one of those things, building sleds are fun for kids and you can try different things and see how they work. And yeah. So. Yeah. Dylan said, uh, he was on customer service duty this past week and said that he got a email from somebody in Texas who's already started on a few sleds Wow! because he's got some grandkids, I think in Wyoming. And I mean, September Wyoming, you know, right. Snow's right around the corner. Right. I was going to say, Texas, they had their big snow <laughs> freeze. I don't know if they're going to get another one, but might as well be prepared, I guess. Yeah. 
No, so he was going to send some up for Christmas presents or something or whatever. So Cool. Yeah. All right. I think that wraps up today's episode. If, uh, like I said, if you have any questions, comments, or smart remarks about what you've heard on the Shop Notes podcast or any topics that we could talk about, uh, I know that we have a looming discussion on sanding based on some comments from a while ago. So, or if you have any guests you'd like to see here from people who are on staff or whatever, we'd love to hear from you. You can email us at woodsmith at woodsmith.com, or you can also leave comments on our YouTube channel. Uh, keep in mind that the Shop Notes podcast is free because of people like you who support Woodsmith Magazine by subscribing or becoming a Woodsmith Unlimited member. So uh, I would encourage you to look into that. You can check that out at woodsmith.com. Uh, you can also find the show notes page, woodsmith.com slash podcast. Thanks for listening, everybody, and we'll see you next week. This episode of the Shop Notes podcast is brought to you by Woodsmith Plans. You'll find nearly a thousand plans covering everything that you'd want to build. From furniture projects to gift projects, kitchen accessories, workshop projects and jigs, and more. Find your next project at woodsmithplans.com.